two big enemies of concentration are sensual desire and ill will. It's all too easy as you're sitting here putting aside your duties of the day, your various responsibilities. And you create an empty space here in the present moment. And these are the thoughts that come flooding in, the central pleasures you would like to think about. When the Buddha talks about sensuality, it's not so much the pretty things out there or the nice sounds or the good tastes or whatever. It's our obsession with thinking about these things, mulling them over and over in the mind. And it's a peculiar fascination because we don't get any nourishment about it. You can think about food all day, but it doesn't nourish you. The same with ill will. The mind settles down and is still for a minute, and then you suddenly think about the people who've harmed you, the injustices that you've been subject to. And even though it's not a pleasant thing to think about, the mind feeds and feeds and feeds on these things. perhaps out of a sense of self-justification. After all, that person really did do those horrible things, and you'd like to see him or her get what's coming to them. But this totally destroys any opportunity for the mind to settle down, to be at ease, to have a sense of solid foundation here in the present moment. So you've got to learn how to think about the drawbacks of these things. Ill will is the easier of the two, because we all know what happens with ill will. People get into arguments, they get into fights, all the strife in the world. The suffering is obvious, and it's easy to look at ourselves when we're really angry at somebody or have a lot of ill will that we see that the mind is on fire. And it's not a pleasant place to be. The drawbacks of sensuality are harder to see. This is where the mind really gets resistant to the Buddhist teachings on putting aside sensuality, learning how to practice renunciation. You look at the drawbacks of sensuality. Someone once complained to me, why is the Buddha focused so much on the negative side of sensuality? And the reason is because we tend to focus so much on what we see as the positive side, all the pleasure we get out of thinking about these things. But it too gets in the way. I mean, if the thoughts come into the mind again and again and again, they create ruts. And from thinking, it tends to go to action, words you say, things you do. And it's useful often to stop and think about all the stupid things you've done under the influence of sensual desire. To realize that there must be a better way of finding happiness, and there must be a better kind of happiness. Of course, one of the best ways of undercutting that fascination with sensuality is to develop an alternative kind of pleasure. It's almost like we have a catch-22. If you're fascinated with sensuality, it's hard to get into concentration, and if you can't get into concentration, then it's hard to really pull yourself away from sensuality. But you can chip at this bit by bit, and this is one of those areas where you want to use your wisdom to develop concentration. Use your discernment to develop concentration. It's the theme of one of Ajahn Mahabhava's books. In fact, it was his book of meditation instructions is entitled Discernment Fosters Concentration. You have to think about these things for a bit to realize the drawbacks of sensuality, realize the advantages of finding a happiness inside, even when you haven't fully tasted how 
really good the pleasure of concentration can be. You want to open your mind to that possibility and use that as a motivation, realizing there is something better. It's a totally harmless pleasure. You don't get intoxicated. You can see things clearly. This is one of the immediate drawbacks of getting tied up in sensual thinking is that your mind gets dulled. You don't see things for what they are. You see things only from one side. It's a pleasure that blinds you, whereas the pleasure that comes from concentration helps foster clear, clear seeing, clear vision. And again, think of all the trouble that people get into over sensuality. We think of anger as being a big cause of the harm that people do to one another. But where does the anger come from? It comes from thwarted sensual desires. As the Buddha points out, in order to maintain your sensual desires, in order to get them, you've got to work really hard, and sometimes your work fails. Or it succeeds, and then people run off with the results of your work. It's because of sensual desires that people get into quarrels within the family, between families, between nations. And then there's a the whole element of fear. One of the reasons we're afraid of dying is for fear of losing our sensual pleasures. And we think of our sensual thinking as a gift to ourselves, and we learn how, you have to learn how to realize that it's not. I mean, a lot of this has to do, of course, with the advertising industry. You know, those chocolates that come with wrappers that have little bits of chocolate wisdom in them, and the chocolate wisdom is ten, tends to be, take another one, indulge yourself, be nice to yourself. You know, that's what it is. Be nice to yourself. Give yourself more cholesterol problems. But there is that way of thinking that when you're feeling really miserable, well, give yourself an ice cream cone, give yourself some food, give yourself something sensual to make yourself feel better. I mean, this is one of the ways our parents made us feel better as kids. We tend to indulge ourselves in that way. But you have to ask yourself, especially with the advertising, exactly why are they giving us this bit of chocolate wisdom? So we'll buy more of their chocolates. They don't really care about our health. Don't, they don't care about our well-being. You think of all the politicians who trade on fear. You know, it's because of our attachment to our sensual pleasures. They raise the specter of war. They raise the specter of unemployment, poverty. and push through all kinds of horrible legislation based on that. And as long as we're attached to sensual pleasures, we're going to be suspect, subject to their, their fear-mongering. Think about it. If you weren't attached to sensual pleasures, what would you have to fear? And then nobody could prey on your fears. You'd be more independent, you'd be safer. And this element of independence is really important. Because a lot of our sensual pleasures depend on other people. And they have the right to withdraw those pleasures if they want. And even if they don't want to, they die and they leave us. As the Buddha said, it's like going around with borrowed goods. They can be taken away at any time. In fact, one of the instructions for talking to someone who's about to die, you ask them, are you worried about your family? 
And then you remind them, well, whether you're worried about them or not, it's not going to help them. Let go of that worry. Are you concerned about sensual pleasures? And the answer usually is yes. Okay. And so the, the technique is to get the person to think about more refined sensual pleasures. That you know, The pleasures of the devas are a lot better than human pleasures. They look at human sensual pleasures the same way we'd look at dog sensual pleasures. So think about heavenly sensual pleasures. And then when you think about heavenly sensual pleasures, they can go up many different levels. Each level gets more and more refined. And then finally get to the point where you realize, well, even the sensual pleasures of heaven, they have their end. And when you fall, it's going to be a hard fall. So try to wean your mind from sensual pleasures. That's the advice. Of course, if you wait until you're dying to think about that, it's not going to have much impact because the mind doesn't know where to go. But if you can think that way now, you're realizing you've got to find a better, more solid source for pleasure. And this is one of the issues, of course, that people think that in denying sensual pleasure, denying that it's a good thing. We're going to have to wear hair shirts and make ourselves suffer. In fact, the Buddha himself made that mistake when he was looking for awakening. He thought to get away from your attachment to sensual pleasures, you'd have to inflict pain on yourself. He finally realized that that didn't work. And then realized okay, it's because there's a better pleasure, starting with the pleasures of concentration. So it's a trade. You're trading chocolates for gold. The pleasure that comes from settling down with the breath and working the breath energy through the body, working around the sense of blockage you might have here or there, so there can be a sense of real fullness in the body. You breathe in, and all the different parts of the breath energy in the body are working together. They're energizing one another. And you realize that by allowing the mind to stay right here, it is possible to develop a sense of well-being that you can't get by thinking about pleasures of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. This goes deeper, and it's totally harmless. You're just sitting here aware and breathing. And even though this isn't the ultimate happiness, the ultimate well-being, it's the way there. It's how you get there. Now, you will have to put up with some pain. There's the pain of sitting in meditation, and there's the, the pain of having to say no th to things that you've been saying yes to for who knows how long. That's why we have to con keep on using our discernment to foster our concentration, to keep reminding ourselves that we are headed in a better direction, and that you have to make a trade. Our problem, especially here in the West, is we all want our cake and enlightenment, too. But you have to realize you can't hold on to the cake and gain the enlightenment. You've got to learn how to let go of the cake, let go of the chocolate. Because some pleasures are more worthwhile than others. It's not that pleasure is bad. And that's one way the mind has of defending its attachment to sensuality. Say, well, what's wrong with pleasure? We're not saying there's anything wrong with pleasure, but there are better pleasures. More lasting, less harmful. Remember, it was when the Buddha realized that there is a pleasure that is blameless, the pleasure of concentration. That's when he got on the path. This is after avoiding pleasure for years. So we can learn from his 
the lesson that he won the hard way, that some pleasures are better than others. And the pleasure of concentration takes work, but you're going to be much better off for having worked at it. This is why there's a very direct connection between right resolve and right concentration. Right resolve is the resolve for renunciation, and concentration gets into a right concentration when you can put aside sensuality, put aside unskillful mental qualities, and stay with the breath. So sometimes it helps when you're sitting down to focus on the breath, to reflect on the fact that you're headed toward a better pleasure, a wiser pleasure. That makes it easier to put aside the, the obstacle of sensuality, at least for the time being. So you can really give your full attention to the breath, to the sense of the energy of the body as you feel it from within. And give it a chance to grow. <laughs>